an educational series on cyber security, compliance, and IT governance. Produced with the support of Freedom Technologies, Phoenix's leading managed service provider. All right, I'm going to cheat and share this the easy way. Let me know if you guys can see it. We can see it. Awesome. So, yes, what was the big word today? It was Facebook. Gotta love them. So, what exactly happened? Well, what happened was it was a BGP change, and doesn't surprise me. I I love playing with BGP, but it's one of those things that it's real easy to play with and tamper with. And when you do it, very bad things happen usually very quickly. Um, and it looks like somebody made a change and it wasn't what they expected. So BGP knocked out their systems, Instagram, WhatsApp. Uh, An interesting side note, it affected a lot of other companies, uh, believe it or not, because there was lots of uh, there was an increase in DNS polling, you know, looking for it, trying to find it and things like that. So there's some very interesting other stories that are starting to come out about other companies that had issues because of, um, you know, linking to or working with the various systems at Facebook, you know, you know, authenticate with Facebook type things. Yeah, so so it, I'm sure it, we'll it hear more. The authentication? Uh, I was told that it did authentic, that it did affect the authentication. Now, again, you know, we're still, you know, hours after the event. So I'm sure it'll take another day for it to really come out about how much. Um, most of those things are tokenized. So if you're still within your token, it wouldn't have caused a problem. But if you had not had a token, it probably did cause an issue. So again, as we learn more about the incident, I'm sure we'll also learn more about what other things outside of Facebook that got impacted. And, you know, looking at it again, Oops, I'm jumping around a lot here. So there's there's data starting to pop up. Uh, I didn't copy any other one, unfortunately. It looks like it did not. Um, there's more data coming in with updated timeline about what happened. Uh, you can go out to Krebs. He's got a good breakdown of it. Of course, he always does. So you'll see more information starting to populate out there about the timeline and what exactly happened when. Uh, definitely a BGP, uh, as we talked about. Um, lots going on over the last couple of months. I'm not going to go back two months, uh, first of all, because A, it gets old after a while, and B, um, you know, there's enough data here that it'll all make us depressed as is. So one of the first ones we, you know, we probably heard about was the Pandora spills that have occurred, um, affecting the quote-unquote super rich. Uh, what's interesting here is it is almost 12 million confidential files uh, right now, the journalists have it. I don't know of any source where I could go down and download all of it. What was probably the most significant thing I pulled out of this was that the information within those 12 million uh, confidential files was derived from 14 offshore services, uh, service companies. So the big question remains of, well, how did they get the data? You know, What group is doing this? To what end did they release it? Uh, so there's standby, there's going to be have to be a lot more that come out of this. Um, as we get more and more information about the papers and where they are sourced from, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more information about um, who potentially also has been hacked because of this. Uh, obviously, if it was in 14 different firms, there's either a common thread that somebody pulled on to get into all 14, or this was a pretty elaborate hack to pull off all that data. Um, Facebook, more Facebook, you've got the whistleblower that's testifying. Uh, I pulled this one out and highlighted it because this last sentence here, you know, before quitting her job, she copied a trove of internal company memo, uh, memos and information. This is a real common problem uh, I'm out there in the industry is you get the insider that says, I'm going to leave. I've got a better job going over to competitor XYZ. Will you be able to tell that they've taken data, you know, what's preventing them from taking data. Um, and the reason it's difficult in, in you know, it's, it's difficult because one, typically they're not elevating their rights. It's within their rights to pull the information in the first place. And oftentimes the USB isn't monitored or email isn't monitored. Uh, email is, is a funny one because I remember when we wouldn't allow attachments larger than a megabyte. Now I see 20 megabyte attachments coming in 
you know, all the time in and out. So moving data is actually pretty easy, even in lockdown environments. So this insider threat, which is what this was effectively, um, is interesting to me because they didn't have any controls that prevented it or at least alerted them that something was going on. So again, I'm watching the Facebook whistleblower stuff more to figure out, uh, you know, what the failures were in technology and why. Is it, you know, the fact that we all have similar issues and it's just too intrusive? Uh, I don't know how many people out there have run DLP software, but if you run DLP software for any length of time, you'll learn to hate it very quickly. Um, I'm sure it has a great value in some locations, but more often than not, it gets in my way. So I'm sure we can have a whole night just talking about DLP. We do have some wins out there for ransomware. Uh, they did nab at least a couple of people um, in the Ukraine. And I would say that I wouldn't call these major ones because of just the dollar amounts engaged here, but it's a start. Um, I think, again, one of the last elements that I highlighted there, what, what uh, I pulled out of this was, you know, they're doing this by primarily two different things, uh, spear phishing. Um, and we all know how difficult that is to stop. You can only do education, education, education to help your users. And at some point, quite honestly, they get real good. It's hard to spot some of these, especially if you're moving quick and they've you know, made the domain that, that things are gonna go to look very similar to what you would expect. So phishing is getting to be a real, real difficult thing. So I won't blame the users too much, but I still blame them. Uh, the bigger one I, I have an issue with there is RDP connections across the internet. We had a lot of explosion of RDP being used uh, to remotely connect because of COVID. And because it was an overnight thing to where, oh my God, we've got to get these people in, we'll secure it later. And I know we've all heard that term secure it later. Things were opened up, connections were allowed, protocols were allowed that um, I'm sure most security people sat in back and cringed at, but you couldn't stop the business from being a business. Um, and that whole we'll fix it later never came to be because you know things are working, why break them now? And I think that's one of the hearts of seeing so many attacks on RDP. Again, um, would need to dig into this much deeper, but I think that that's where I, we see an explosion in that being used. Uh, the VPNs, VPNs, it, it, this one surprised me a little bit because it's a VPN. You should have it secure right from the get-go. If you don't have it secure right from the get-go, I, I don't know what to say. Um, this is just a failure if you've got a problem with a VPN, other than some of the zero days out there. I'll give you a little bit of leeway for that. Um, but we're hearing stories of lots of VPNs where there's not 2FA and things like that. And that's just, that's not, a, that's just completely unacceptable. Uh, Coinbase, anybody out there using Coinbase? Well, I hope you weren't one of the 6,000 people that were alerted that your data is, your coins are gone. Goodbye. Um, this is interesting to me because again, this, where the vulnerability occurred is it was in the SMS account recovery process. And what gets me about this is this goes back to software becoming more and more complex, um, software developers. And I'm going to say this and people can throw stones at me later. Um, software development is not what I'm seeing in, in younger generations is it's becoming more clicky, clicky, mousy, mousy, where you've got somebody who is writing pieces of code and making them a little widget. And then all you have to do is on a screen, drag and drop these widgets and the software will connect them in the back end. And so your the developers um, are doing less about real development. They're, they're connecting the dots, if you will. The problem is, is they don't understand what's behind that. And I think that's one of the reasons that I find software security uh, getting worse, not better. Uh, and in the case of this, it could have been something as simple as it was a piece of code that wasn't scanned, although we're gonna talk about that in a minute, or it could be something that was more obscure and harder to determine. Um, again, this is one of those reasons that when we talk about cryptography, I am really big on not writing my own cryptography. I'm not a cryptographer, I'm not a mathematician. I don't wanna to try to be one. Um, I use validated code and not using validated code 
you know, can introduce these types of problems. So it'll be interesting seeing if anything ever comes out about what the true flaw in this one was. And that's where I'm watching it for is to look and see, was this because they grabbed an open source package or was this because they just simply had core, poor coding practices? Uh, we, we have an interesting situation here. The, there was a hospital in Alabama that got hit with ransomware. And because the heart monitors, in this case, the fetal heart monitor, they were not available. Um, it doesn't say whether or not they were really, the crypto locker got it to them or they simply took them offline. Whole point is it wasn't available. Um, and it basically caused them not to be able to monitor uh, an infant and the infant died. So this may be the first case of where, first documented case of where cyber warfare has led to a death, specifically ransomware. Um, this one stoked a lot of feelings in me because I've been saying this for a long time. Certain key systems, in my opinion, should have not be on a company's backbone. Uh, I would consider these things like anything dealing with life necessities in a hospital, um, power control for a power plant, uh, those types of things. They have no business being on an enterprise backbone or being somewhere that can either get to the internet or you know, via a bridge get to the internet. Uh, and this is a big problem because I see a lot of this and we see a lot of it in the events that we've talked about and it's because of convenience. So watch this space and let's see how this develops if anybody really if actions taken, people get woken up by it. Um, API flaw, I wanted to point this out because we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about some of the software problems. Everyone's connecting to everyone else via APIs. And what I've found, because I actually look at APIs, is most people don't look at the APIs and whether or not they're doing things securely. Uh, in some cases, I found where, you know, an API could be used and you wanted the person to be able to read data. But when you actually looked at the API, it gave them full access to the data. Instead of just read, it was read, write, and delete. So APIs are a wonderful thing, but there's we can't just say, oh, it's secure because they're using an API. We really need to dive into those APIs, which, by the way, is a unique skill set unto its own because now you effectively you're kind of doing the security risk analysis, but you're also doing software security analysis. So it's a different skill set than a lot of people have. So if somebody's looking for an area of focus, software security, software security, and software security. Um, I thought this one was interesting. Uh, <laughs> So a couple of things came out of this one. I'll start with the one that's not as uh, impressive, but most C-level executives in Canada and UK say they would pay ransom to their cyber attackers. This is why we're not gonna see ransomware going away anytime soon. That, that is the key. That's just gonna fuel them. Um, the other thing that struck me in this article is out of the US executives, 31% 31 believe that retaliatory cyber attacks against foreign nations would be effective in putting a halt to them. Boy, I can't, that just scares me to no end because if I wanted to just cause pure chaos, I've got systems in a host country that I wanna have impacted. I just go launch against the US and do some pretty heavy duty damage. And now the US is acting as my weapon, if you will. I, that really makes me nervous. This is this to me is a knee jerk reaction. It's great to say it's really hard to execute on without causing blowback on yourself. Uh, <laughs> half of all web owners don't know their site has been hacked. This is pretty, pretty scary. Um, they, you know, this 80% of respondents said that third party scripts and open source libraries account for 50 to 70% of their website. And again, I've talked to people that grab code from the internet and use it. And I say, how do you make sure that that code hasn't, doesn't have a vulnerability? Are you monitoring it? Well, no, that's, that's Tom's code from over here. We just grabbed it and I'll go off every so often and look and see if there's a new version, but they're not actively looking to see if there's a vulnerability in the code that they've been, they should be aware of. And I think, again, this is part of our let's reuse and use open source, but not necessarily watch for the problems within the open source community. So this is really scary because to me, 
this means there's a lot more stuff out there I can probably get into than not. Uh, let's see, I think I only got a couple more here. Bear with me. Okay, containers. I know everyone out there loves Docker images. They like building their containers. This drives me nuts because everyone goes out, they grab their Docker image, they deploy their container, and they go on with life. Docker images are awesome things, but they should not be trusted 100%. You need to be scanning your Docker images. You need to be scanning them on a regular basis. And if they have vulnerabilities in them, you shouldn't be using them. And unfortunately, I can tell you, because we we're doing a good job watching for these things, I will agree that most of the pieces of code that we get that are Docker images, containers, have issues in them, period, end of story. Sometimes they're minor issues, Sometimes they're major issues, major issues like critical vulnerabilities, um, known secrets being stored in them. Uh, I had a really bizarre one the other day that the actual private key for the public private key pair was actually contained in the image, which I'm not sure why you would do that, but we had the private key. Um, so lots of things here. And again, as these things become more and more common and abundant, you've got to be scanning this stuff. Otherwise, you're just going to open yourself up. So 